Hello everyone and welcome to this presentation with Integrum. Uh, my name is Eric Castle and I'm doing MedTech research here at ABG. Uh, and today we all have the pleasure of having the CEO of Integrum here with us, De Carbon Mark. Uh, and he will host a presentation for us and we'll follow that up with a short Q&A. Uh, but without further ado, uh, I'll leave the floor over to you, Rickard, for the presentation. Yes, thank you very much. And um, at, uh, actually, uh, you see uh, another Richard here on, on the slide. So that is Mr. Richard Cicero, a wounded warrior in the US. And you see he had a lot of accidents and we've been trying to help him. So without further ado, can I have the next slide, please? So maybe you understand we're in the field of amputation and that, that this is a major limb amputation and it's a, a very challenging change in life, which affects both body and physical integrity, of course, but also mental and social well-being, not least related to the financial impact on, on work capacity. In Sweden, there is about uh, two and a half thousand persons that become amputated every year. But if you go to US, that is our priority market, there is 185,000 male limb amputations occurring. And there are right now about two million living and the expectation is that it will be 4 million by 2050. Next slide, please. So what has the company do, done so far? Actually, the company started in 1998, but we went public in 2017 and really started our commercial travel. And we have um, a fantastic collaboration with the Department of Defense. We have a letter of intent signed a couple of years ago where the Department of Defense is using our product to see if that can help to increase quality of life for wounded warriors. We are working with some of the most prestigious uh, hospitals in Europe uh, and the US. We'll come back to that, but one is Johns Hopkins, very well respected. We have over the years performed more than 500 and actually successful surgeries because uh, that they are successful has been investigated by FDA and uh, we got the full PMA approval for our implant system for above knee amputees in December 2020. Next slide, please. So, so we are addressing uh, a large unmet medical need with the amputation. And we have our own implant system that we call the Oprah implant system. We have a very strong leadership in the US, very unique position because we, we the only company that has a commercially um, approved system. Um, we're working with uh, 12 of the 20 top, top hospitals in the US right now. We are growing and we are improving profitability. We have some absolutely smashing things in pipeline and if the video is working you will see see that later on and we are uh, strengthening our management team and board of directors and and that's now very experienced next slide please so so what is it that we're really doing well the amputation has been around for long and until we really started with the implant system the best solution was the socket that you see in the middle picture here and that has not really been a technology that you can improve a lot. And I will talk about that. Next slide, please. So we come from an other direction. And maybe you heard about dental implants and osteointegration um, developed by my father um, originally in Gothenburg. The first patient treated in the world was in 1965. And mostly it's been used for Dental implants, bone anchored hearing aids, and, and other stuff in the ENT. Next slide, please. So we use this for what we call orthopedic osteointegration. And here you see a fantastic guy from France um, out in uh, the nature, regaining his freedom and quality of life. Next slide, please. So with the socket, you cannot do this really good because all the load will need all the loads will need to be transferred from the bone inside the stump through the muscles and skin to that hard white shell. And that's not a good way of transferring loads from a biomechanical perspective. Next slide, please. 
So we bypass the socket completely. We get rid of it and all the drawbacks by having an implant that sits inside the skeleton, an osseo integrated implant, and it goes out through the skin. And all the loads will be transferred from the bone through the implant directly out to the prosthesis. So there's no load transfer to the soft tissues, and that's causing all the problems with the socket. So we get rid of all of that. Next slide, please. What we also have done is that we have um, been working now almost 10 years to add control features to the implant system. So not only mechanical connection, also actually some kind of brain connection. The implant system is hollow and we can change certain components. So as you see on the left here, we have a lot of wires going to muscles and also to nerves. And by using this system, the brain can talk to the external prosthesis and the prosthesis can talk back to the brain. Next slide, please. Både i Lövånger och Västerbotten med fru och tre barn. 2011 var jag med om en högspänningsolycka i ett ställverk och blev kraftigt brännskadad. Förlorade min vänstra arm. Och efter det så fick jag då börja använda en hylsprotes. Som jag egentligen aldrig kände mig bekväm i. Den satt dåligt och var svår att kontrollera. Svår att få sätta som man ville på morgonen. Efter ett tag så kände jag det att min högra hand började domna av och jag fick problem med rörelseförmågan i vänster axel och ryggen började kännas sne. Jag tänkte att det här måste finnas något bättre. Och då kom jag i kontakt med Integrum och blev erbjuden att prova Opera-systemet, vilket jag då valde att göra. Och efter två operationer och en del rehabilitering så kunde jag då börja använda den protes jag har idag och det har ju öppnat upp en helt ny värld. Det, det går inte att jämföra, det är så otroligt mycket bättre. Systemet är lätt att använda. Jag tar på mig hucken, klickar fast den och startar den på några sekunder den är igång. Med hylsprotesen kunde man få ta på den flera gånger innan det väl börjar fungera. Det kan ta upp till 20 minuter en halvtimme innan man kan börja använda den på morgonen så att det, det kändes alltid bekvämt. Det som var kvar då, det var ju att ytelektroderna var väldigt störkänsliga för mig. Jag kunde aldrig riktigt lita på greppet när man var i en miljö med mycket elektronik. Helt plötsligt kunde handen bara öppna om man tappar saker. Då blev jag erbjuden att delta i ett forskningsprojekt som en av hittills fyra personer. Och det heter då eOpera och då har de opererat in elektroderna i armen, vilket har gjort att det är Störningarna för mig är helt borta och precisionen är mycket, mycket mer finkänslig. Jag kan göra väldigt små rörelser och styra ännu bättre ovanför huvudet. Och det, det, det är en helt ny värld även det. Och det möjliggör även att jag får en viss känselrespons tillbaka. När jag tar i saker så känner jag att greppet finns där. I och med att vi då lever på en gård och jag hade tidigare ett väldigt aktivt liv, det finns sysslor att göra hela tiden och har ett stort motorsportintresse så var jag väldigt begränsad med min hylsprotes. Ja, man litar inte på greppet och det var svårt att röra sig. Idag så har ju allt det där börjat komma tillbaka mer och mer. Jag hittar nya saker varje dag som jag kan göra och ja, jag känner det som tidigare då, då bar man en protes som ett hjälpmedel. Idag är protesen mer en del av mig. Jag ser det inte som att jag bär protes. Det är en helt ny värld. Next slide, please. So, so um, with these technologies, what what are we really bringing to the market? Well, so it's the Opera implant system that is really at the core what we offer today. We also have developed uh, another tool that is very valuable for amputees. Sometimes you can have something called phantom limb pain. And 
and can actually be up to 80% of the amputees to have that. And we have a special virtual reality based on artificial intelligence, the intelligence that can uh, train the brain to reduce the pain. And then we have what you saw here on the, on the video, we have really the future, the mind control prosthesis. Uh, but that is still a product in development. Uh, of course, there is a lot of interest from the Department of Defense to help us to bring that technology to the market. Next slide, please. So as I have briefly said, we are the only really commercial actor in this field in the US. We got the PMA in December 2020. And uh, maybe you know something about PMA. It's, it's a very tough procedure. And it's a, really a quality stamp when the FDA is giving um, a company a full PMA. And, and that is what's helping us to change, you know, come with a new technology, to change the perception in the market that this is experimental. Now, it's really no one that can say that it's experimental. And we are now moving into the next phase, and that is when we should establish this as the new standard of care. We see that the PMA is also helping us when it comes to recruit some new patients to faci facilitate reimbursement negotiations with uh, uh, public uh, providers of healthcare and, and uh, the insurance systems in the US. Next slide, please. So if we look at the market size uh, and we look into the US and also add our target the European markets will have about 3 million living with amputations. And the subpopulation we are targeting is those with amputation caused by trauma or cancer. And then we are targeting the subgroup there that is typically above the knee amputees, and that's the 260,000. And with an average price for our implant system per patient that will lead to a target market value of about 8 billion US dollars. Next slide, please. So let's talk more about the US. Next slide, please. And here if we break it down. And again, we use the same average price. And that this is what we have disclosed. But I think everyone knows that uh, the price might be somewhat higher in the US, but then it's still with that 30,000 K. The 30 K will be about 6 billion US dollars. Next slide, please. So that was the, the pool. And what is the, the contribution? And here you see the figures, the 185,000 I was talking about, and that's broken down to what is uh, relevant for our above knee amputees, and that is be about 200 million US dollars. Next slide, please. So we, we have a fairly uh, reasonable size market, and how can we address it? Well, you know, one will be to, to work to with centers of excellence, and we have those, Johns Hopkins, University of California, San Francisco, all to read. University of Southern California in LA. We are also now expanding uh, other, into other centers and into further of these high level centers. Well, one problem is that uh, uh, you need a fairly um, big sales organization to, to penetrate with um, the right pace. So we signed an agreement with Oncos a smaller niche orthopedic implant company, very dedicated to university settings because that is in, inside orthopedic oncology. Uh, and they have about 150 independent sales reps and that would um, most likely help us to penetrate the US market more quicker. We are also spending a lot of time and effort to educate in principle everyone that this new technology exists. We have surgeons, of course, we have the rehabilitation specialists, and not least we have the patients. And we're doing a lot of efforts now to spread the information to all of them. And long term, we see that we should be able, that's my view, 
and also some of the leading surgeons in the US, we should be able to establish this as a new standard of care. Next slide, please. So here we are sort of reiterating, you know, the leading hospitals, oncos, and what I didn't mention is that we have a prosthetic component that acts like a ski binding, and that is actually distributed in the US by Utobock. And Utobock, that's the biggest uh, prosthetic company in the world. Next slide, please. So this will be the biggest game changer in amputation care ever. We are currently in the leading position and we plan to stay there. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Richard. And this is obviously a very exciting product. But I just thought that we could start off with talking about patient access to this. Um, in, in currently, what's, what's the reimbursement situation like? How much of the, of the prosthetic is covered by reimbursement versus out-of-pocket expenses for patients? Yeah, you know, this is a big question. So I try to be a bit brief. Um, so the, 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 the low-hanging fruits would be with the partner of defense. Their uh, reimbursement is a separate system. And the other, which I didn't really talk about that, we, we're just about to start uh, collaboration out with Veterans Affairs. That's also a reimbursement system that will just provide um, both the implant and the prosthetics to the patients. And then we have the big uh, ordinary public hospitals where we have health insurance providers, where we see that it is still a, a struggle, but it's being easier now with the PMA, but we will need to, to put a lot of efforts uh, into to that. And maybe, you know, there are like 2,300 independent health insurance providers in the US. So over time, we need to negotiate these with, with most of them. And then in a maybe longer perspective, we also have for the retired, that's Medicare, et cetera. But right now we're really targeting 22 to 65 in the US so that will not be our short term goal. Mm, thank you. Um, and you're sort of currently in a monopoly position when it comes to regulatory approval uh, and patents as well. Uh, and do you think this will become some sort of golden standard in the future? And if so, I would assume that there would be new competition entering. And how do you view the timeline of that in that case? Yes, yeah, so, so uh, I, I'm, I'm pretty confident for, for, the, for the selected patient population, this would be the preferred treatment. Uh, and I think a lot of people can agree that. So uh, what about competition? Well, we have some uh, competition outside the US. It's difficult to enter the US, you know, the, the PMA, that's, mm. that's a lot, that's a heavy. So the big players, they haven't started their clinical trials yet. And if you start a clinical trial, you need to recruit patients, say that that takes a minimum of a year, that you need to do the study as a minimum of two years follow up, so that is three years. Then you need to write a report that might be another year or say half a year, and then the average um, approval time is 18 months. So that's we're up to five years once they start the clinical trials. And none of the big players has done that yet. So, so our expectation is, you know, minimum three years, most likely five, maybe seven years. Okay, well, that's interesting. Uh, and then in terms of possible indication, I mean, the ones you're targeting right now are fairly narrow, uh, but I would assume there's a lot more potential out there. What sort of new indications could you be targeting and what would be the potential of that? Um, okay, so, so right now in, in the U.S., which is, you know, we have 80% of our revenue in the U.S., it is above knee amputations. In the Europe, we also have CMR for above elbow amputations, slower, uh, um, lower numbers, but still something we would like to bring to the U.S. market. Then we also have approval for digits, and that, that's it. especially it's the thumb amputations where, where this technology is really, really very good. Um, However, if we take a more long-term approach, it will be below knee amputations, which is the biggest uh, limb amputee population. However, they do better with sockets than above knee amputees. Mm. So if we can get this to be standard of care for below knee amputees in the future, that will 
double the size of the market. Mm. Okay, thank you very much. That's super exciting. Um, and in the interest of time, we need to wrap up now. And I would like to thank you very much, Ricker, for doing this presentation with us. Very interesting here about uh, Integrum. Uh, and also thank you to everyone listening in as well. Um, we will go in on a short lunch break now, about an hour, and then return. Uh, so thank you very much. Thank you.